When we talked about noise and filtering, you saw that some of the unique properties of chaos can actually be turned to advantage. This segment takes that much further into the control of chaos. And by that, I don't mean simply squelch chaos out of existence. I mean, take advantage of, for example, sensitive dependence on initial conditions to get something done that you want to get done. Here are the concepts from the previous nine units of this course that will play a role in this discussion. We're going to use sensitive dependence on initial conditions for leverage, and we're going to use the denseness with which trajectories cover chaotic attractors to prove that we can actually get where we want to go, and we're going to use the stable and unstable manifold structure to stabilize ourselves once we get there. Now we need a bit of basic control theory here, the notion of feedback control. Imagine the thermostat on the wall of my office. It has some set point. I wanted it, you know, 21 degrees Celsius. It measures the temperature, and if the temperature is below 21, it turns up the heat. If the temperature is above 21, it turns down the heat. Note that the sign really matters. If the sign is flipped and the thermostat reacts to it being too hot in here by turning up the heat, then the system will saturate. It'll peg the heater all the way to the, to the top setting, and it'll get really hot in here. We call that positive feedback. That's the one that says, if you're too hot, turn up the heat. Negative feedback is the, if you're too hot, turn down the heat. That's the one that's used in engineering practice. Now, let's think about this in state space and consider how if we had a saddle in our hands and we had a, a small bar, ball and we wanted to balance it on that saddle, how we could move the saddle around in order to do that. If this is the head of the horse and this is the tail of the horse and this is the girth, if the ball falls down that way, I want to move the saddle that way to catch it. Basically, you're moving the saddle so that the place you want to balance it is right where the ball is. And those of you who have some control theory background know that this hand waving is what's called pole placement. Now, the geometry of the saddle makes a real difference here. If the ball is falling down the girth of the horse, then I really have to go quickly to catch it. Whereas if the ball is moving up the uh, spine of the horse, I don't have to move so quickly in order to catch it. That's simply because in this direction, the dynamics are helping you. They're pushing the ball towards where you want to go. And if the horse is very thin, that is, the direction this way is very steep, there's a large positive Lyapunov exponent, then I have to react even more quickly to catch the ball. Now, turning this around, you can think about the range of initial conditions, that is, the places where the ball could be, that for me, with my fixed reaction time, I can recover and catch it. But outside that region, I couldn't catch it. Here, I've drawn in the region of the saddle where, if the ball starts there and I have a finite reaction time, I can catch it using the approach I just outlined. Now, an aside, saddle points in nonlinear systems only look like this locally. If we backed up, we would see that the stable and unstable manifolds actually curve. Then you need nonlinear control, which is much, 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 much harder, and we will not go there in this course. Last building block here, those words about cross-sectional eigenstructure on this slide. If you are on a 3D chaotic attractor and you take a cross-section perpendicular to the direction of the flow, the eigenstructure looks exactly like this picture. Remember, there's one positive Lyapunov exponent, that's this manifold, and there's one negative Lyapunov exponent, that's this manifold. And then there's a zero Lyapunov exponent kind of into the slide in the direction of the flow where the growth is sub-exponential. All of those ideas, put together properly, let us control chaotic systems. What do I mean by control? I mean, get me from some point A in the state space, the green one, to some other point B while minimizing or maximizing some cost. I might want to do it as fast as possible and I don't care how much gas I use. I might want to try to do this with the least amount of gas. Here's an example. Controlling the Lorentz system. That is, given the dynamical system, that's the Lorentz equations, can we design a controller that manipulates the parameters so as to, to get from this green x to that red x? Because of the denseness with which any trajectory in the basin of attraction of this attractor covers that attractor, all you have to do to get this to happen is find a parameter value such that there exists a chaotic attractor that has at least one thread that's close to the point you want to get to. Then the control strategy, which is a pretty simple control strategy, amounts to turn the parameter knob to that setting and wait. And the denseness will assure that the trajectory will eventually get near that red X. 
Well then, what do we do now? You can't just necessarily put on the brakes and screech to a halt at that point, but you can find an unstable periodic orbit near that red X. Remember those things? And there are an infinite number of them of all periods densely embedded in any chaotic attractor? That means we can find one near that red X. And once we find one, we can actually stabilize the system on it. That is, we can balance the ball on the crater rim as it goes round and round using the local linear control strategy that I just discussed. And that's because that UPO is embedded in the attractor, and that attractor has the cross-sectional stable and unstable manifold structure that we need in order to carry out the control. You need to know the directions of the manifolds and the magnitudes of the lambdas to build the controller, but you now know how to do that after the past several units. So in summary, you use the denseness of trajectory coverage to get near your destination, you use the denseness of unstable periodic orbits to find one near your destination, and then you use local linear control to stay on that UPO once you get nearby. And nearby is the rectangle in that drawing. Control theory people will recognize all that as a proof of both what are called reachability and controllability. This scheme is called OGY control after Ed Ott, Celso Gruboji, and James York, and the original paper is that one that's down in the bottom right of the slide. Using denseness to prove reachability is useful in practice. Here's an early paper on this. The idea here was to improve a particular circuit design using that find an attractor that touches the point you want to get to and just wait idea. But there's a problem, and that's alluded to on the last bullet of this slide. How long will you wait for the trajectory to get there? Possibly a long time, and there's no way to establish any firm bounds. How to get around this? One way is by exploiting another of chaos's unique properties, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. This is intuitively very appealing. If a small change can have a large effect, that can give you a lot of leverage. I could get in my car, I could touch my accelerator and my steering wheel lightly, just right, and then I could sit back while my car drives to Boston. Of course, if I mess up, the error will grow exponentially. There are a ton of approaches to this. The two earliest, from around 1990, were Troy Shinbrot's PhD thesis, he was a student of OG and Y, and my PhD thesis. Troy did a beautiful mathematical treatment of this problem. I wrote an artificial intelligence tool that did it in a quick and dirty but automated way. Here's the controller that my tool built for the task that I showed you before. But rather than just setting the knob to some value and waiting, it tweaks the knob a couple of times really carefully and as a result, gets there a lot faster. Since then, there have been lots and lots and lots of variations and new methods proposed, and lots and lots of applications of all those ideas to a ton of real systems, including lasers, heart fibers, hippocampus cells, magnetoelastic ribbons, all sorts of circuits, and many, many other things. Troy's review paper, which I will put on the supplemental materials page of this course, is the go-to reference on all of this. Here's another fun application of this stuff. This is Eric Bolt's PhD thesis work. And you can kind of tell from the picture what's going on. Eric was trying to figure out how to get a spacecraft to the moon using less gas. And he wrote also a program that found places where it could deliver a very small tap to the spacecraft in the form of a small burn of the engine. And those small taps would add up to the large effect of the spacecraft getting to the moon using a lot less gas. Of course, the standard trade-off, if you're using less gas, you're not going to go as fast. In this particular application, I think Eric's trajectory used 38% less gas, but instead of the normal home and transfer orbit to the moon, which takes about a week, this took two years. So it took a lot longer, but you can carry a lot more payload if you don't have to use as much gas. Gas is one of the really critical limitations in spacecraft world. This is another really interesting idea. This is Jeff Parker's PhD thesis work. And here's his idea. You want to get from some place A to some other place B. You look for the set of states that are dynamically downhill from A, where you want to start, and you look for the set of states that are dynamically uphill from the place you want to get to. That is, respectively, the unstable manifold of the place you're starting and the stable manifold of the place you want to get to in state space. And then you look to see if those two things touch. So here's an example of the unstable manifold in brown of the orbit that he wanted to start from and the stable manifold in green of the orbit that he wanted to get to. 
And the fact that those two things intersect means that you can ride downhill on the unstable manifold, and then at exactly the right point, you have to change your velocity a tiny bit, and then you ride downhill on the stable manifold. If things intersect perfectly, which happens sometimes, you can do this for free, which is really quite amazing. So nonlinear and chaotic dynamics aren't just important to know about because they're interesting and ubiquitous and fascinating. They're also important because they can play a real role in design.